Hello everyone, my guest today is Brendan Carroll. He's the co-founder and CEO of SkyCision, an award-winning technology provider that helps enhance the productivity and profitability of the global agriculture industry. Brendan, are you ready to take us to the top? Absolutely. All right, man, tell us about the company. What do you guys do and uh, how do you make money? Yeah, absolutely. So we help farmers uh, enhance their productivity of their crops and their fields, as well as the profitability of their operation. And we do that by basically giving them more of a, uh, a real-time view and control of their operation. So traditionally farming, they, it's uh, very labor-driven and reactive. So they would have manual labor walking their fields or driving it by a pickup truck, hundreds of thousands of acres. They take a sample, generalize it, but a lot of times when they go to generalize that sample, things go miss. And that's when pests, disease, weed, mold infestations happen. And that's when they lose crops and ultimately uh, lose potential yields or profitability um, that could be driving revenue for their operation. So we leverage imagery collected by off-the-shelf drones as well as global satellites and fuse that with sensor data from their fields to give them an idea of exactly how crops are performing in real time and also what are the driving factors behind that. So does does every every one of your customers have to buy one of these drones then or no, you rent them or something? So, so that's something that we um, kind of iterated on this year. So originally, um, we integrated with the world's largest manufacturer, the DJI, who actually created drones. Um, and we originally depended on them having one, and they were very affordable. But we've actually started contracting basically third-party pilots or like drone service providers that are using our analytics to serve farmers. Or we even have some pilots on staff that will go and fly for them for a little bit more. So really, we want to get them the data and make that as accessible as possible. Is that expensive to have your own staff of kind of drone flyers spread all across the world to service your customers? So it it is in, um, it would be if it was just drone pilots. So what we've done is we've actually kind of fused them with a customer success role. And so basically they'll have customers that they're managing. They also have a territory that they might be flying for. And in the meantime, we're basically building out a pilot network of third party that we also have a different customer success team for where we can basically match up almost like an Uber for imagery. I see. I see. So what's the, what's the team size today? So right now we're only a full-time team of six. Okay. Uh, We're in our third year of operation. We started in September of 2015. 2015 and there are six of you. Where are you guys all based? So we're spread out a little bit. Uh, There's three of us here in Pittsburgh, one in California, one in North Carolina, and one in Boston. Okay. And walk me through kind of the revenue model. So is this a pure play SaaS company? What do the farmers pay per month on average? So on average, so it's based on um, per acre and then the number of flights that they have per acre. And so we'll start at like, say, $3 per acre. But if they want to do a 10 or 25,000 acre contract, that might break down to closer to a dollar per acre. Um, kind of building like data economies of scale, if you will. That, that totally makes a lot of sense, tying it directly to those numbers. So what would you say the average is per month? So the average per month um, per customer? Yeah. Um, I'd say they're probably paying about a thousand a month per customer. Okay, that's great. And so does that mean the average farm is about a thousand acres that you're scanning? About 500. 500. Okay, great. And then there's just different volume discounts, which, which make up for that. Correct. Um, all right, so 2015 was launch date. Uh, what are you at today in terms of total customers you're working with? So we're, we're deployed over 200 different operations through um, 11 different customers. So several of those are very large channels. We have over 50. That's in our um, kind of contract stage of our pipeline. We're kind of just going into a year now where the technology is built. It's been validated. It's been verified. And we're kind of um, moving into that sales funnel as we speak. So we're starting to see uh, we're seeing 25 month over month growth um, since January. And so we're probably looking at. 35 to 50 by year's end. Yep. So, so just, be, to just to be clear point. though, I want to make sure though, I'm going to have these numbers right. So 11 customers at a grand a month, you're doing about 11 grand per month right now in revenue? Correct. Yeah. Okay, okay. Got it. So you'll plan to go get that, add another five, six grand of that by the end of the year? Yes, correct. Okay. Why? So, so Brendan, obviously the, the percentage seems really high, but with low numbers, it's actually not a ton of growth. You should be growing like way faster than that. What makes this, why can't you grow this 4X between now and the end of the year? Yeah, absolutely. No, that's a good question. So I think right now at this stage, there's, um, so in our third year, there's certain inefficiencies that we need to basically build out in terms of automation, right? So there's certain things in the back end uh, processing that basically allow this to infinitely scale where someone could just log in and automatically do this versus us having to ha- somehow intervene manually, right? So we're automating that. And then also the sales process at this point, we have to have a manual touch point, um, and so eventually that's going to move to more of a subscription model online as opposed to quoting everything out based on utilization. Well, why have you made the decision to kind of own the whole stack? In other words, the on the boots person representing the, loca- the locale, the customer support, the actual scanning versus just 
owning the tech and then putting the tech in the drone app stores for farmers. Right. Yeah. So um, for us, it's really important to have the interface with the customer. So when we're, th- when we're thinking about actually delivering value to the customer, if we remove one of those links that abstract us, say, from like the mobile app, whoever's flying or whoever's securing that contract with um, the person who's realizing the value from that data, we're removing ourselves from the value realization of the client as well. And so uh, what you're driving at is correct, that it may slow us down initially, but down the road, it's going to substantially, and we've already seen it, enhance our ability to ensure the success of our customers' deployments, overcome hurdles that others in the industry may be experiencing. Is your tech really, really remarkable? Does it do something that no other drone technology can do? It is. Um, I'd say that there's probably about three or four companies that are competitive with what we do today. Uh, but it's on, it's one of the, those four in the market that are on the cutting edge. Correct. I asked just cause this seems like, I mean, you are, you're ex football player, you know, about competition. It, this seems like you're competing on many different fronts and these aren't little battles. These are multi-billion dollar battles. So the, if, if here's my other question, right? So if you sure. don't feel like your tech, if you have, if there's other tech options, three or four that are like yours, but you know, the challenges that they're also probably having with getting all the local farmers across the U S and the country. What if you did the other and you just actually did a role? up strategy and you owned and you built a team that owned essentially all of the relationships with every farmer in the U S and then you sold through and licensed other people's tech. That way you're only competing on one front. I'm trying to get in your head and understand why you're competing on two fronts here. So that's absolutely an opportunity that we could evolve into in the future. Um, right now where we wanted to focus is our, our tech stack is deep, but it's highly nuanced and focused, right? So the drone industry, what you see today is you see a lot of drone manufacturers that are creating drones that can do everything from, um, uh, forestry to um, uh, utility and asset inspection to construction to mining sites. And then there's a lot of companies that are developing apps that are meant to serve the whole drone sector, the whole drone industry across all of these industries. We're specifically focused within agriculture and not even just within agriculture, but we're really focused on nuanced high value crop types. And so in terms of actually taking the imagery and applying computer vision functions that extract nuanced capabilities, we're focused on dominating a niche and then expanding on top of that. And once we do that, then we might look at how we can actually catalyze other components of the industry, say so-and-so has a fantastic platform. Well, maybe one of our computer vision applications can go through them and scale that way. Um, But we've been very focused on dominating a niche to start off and winning something that we can absolutely deliver value on and then expanding incrementally from there. How do you go? So, so obviously understanding a, a scan, I'm making this up of a, of a three acre forest from above and understanding that in the upper right quadrant, there is a termite infestation that someone has Mm -hmm. to take care of. Um, your ability to recognize that nuance from a map that is generated from your technology is directly dependent on how many times you've done that because then the patterns feed your machine and your machine gets smarter. There's obviously significant network effects there for a company that already has a thousand scans done. If you've only done 10 scans, how do you ever overcome those network effects? Yes. So, um, it's not also just the volume of scans, but also the quality of scans, right? So when you think of, this is a field called remote sensing. So when you think of remote sensing, a drone is just a platform. You could also have a manned aircraft or you could have a satellite, um, aircraft and satellite, both battle problems, say with like cloud cover or distance from the ground where drone imagery is a little bit more highly accurate. And so the quality of that data and a lot of data cleansing to even enable those network effects is basically enriched from that. Um, The other thing also is if you're talking about a forest example with termites, to actually train a data set to say, recognize this each and every time, you would have to have a a substantial amount of forest data sets with termite infestations to do that with a high level of confidence. And so by focusing specifically on specialty crop types that are very high value, we're putting ourselves in a position to do this where say others are going much more flat. Got it. That, what, I, I, that's what I was trying to get is what niche you're going at. So name some of these crops that you're focused on. So our, our biggest market right now is in vineyards. Um, we started off in Napa Valley. We have over, uh, I think close to 180 different vineyards that we're working with currently. Um, we're now- These all roll up though to 11 though, cust- actual customers that own multiple vineyards. Correct. So what you see is a lot of times you have like a, uh, a manager, uh, like contract labor, like a vineyard manager, uh, pest control advisor, so on and so forth. And so these customers will actually a lot of times deploy our solutions to 80 to 100 different farms at a time or you know, 40, 50, depending on the size of them. And so we have at half of our clientele is 
basically those kind of channel types. That's interesting. Um, let's talk about, let's go macro level here for a second sure. real quick. The drone industry overall, you know, there's an opera, you know, you know, when, when photography and, and photos came out, now you have all these sites to, uh, like Snapper where you can go hire a photographer on demand anywhere in the world. Uh, the opportunity cost is then you don't have to go buy your own camera, right? Um, do you think there will be, I mean, or it doesn't already want to exist. Will there be a network like that, but for go, you know, rent a drone anywhere in the world, whenever you want versus consumers just buying them directly, that man, that vineyard manager just buying their own drone? So, so there's two elements here. One is, um, the impact of commoditization drones are becoming so affordable and accessible, um, that any kind of grower could go and buy their own drone. The problem is because comes when they really want to use is like an enterprise scientific tool. You have to use the right types of sensors. You have to calibrate. There's certain data collection um, standards that you have to follow that can be painful. And at that point in time, there's more so uh, instead of a drone rental network, there's a drone service provider network where there's basically licensed pilots. These guys are um, professional, basically surveyors um, and really quality results are delivered. And so you hire a pilot to come in and then fly for X amount of hours, X amount of acres or however they price. Um, and, and that's kind of more so the model that you'd be looking at. And can you, so someone who owns a vineyard listening right now might be thinking, well, listen, I'll just get like a basic drone with a camera on it. I'll fly it over my vineyard and I'll see that without having to walk every morning, each row, I'll see that row three in the first 200 feet, like things are turning brown. Right. Mm -hmm. Something's wrong there. Let me go walk out and look at it. Name something that your tech can do that it won't that it's not it's not a visual indicator. It's some other indicator you've picked up. Yeah. So so an off the shelf drone would be great for that use case. Exactly. To basically give you a bird's eye view a uh, visual imagery, just the way you you and I see what we are looking at, though, is actually uh, near infrared light spectrum that the human eye cannot detect. And it's in this spectrum that is hypersensitive to chlorophyll content and photosynthetic activity in the crop. And so what happens is we're actually measuring reflectance profiles. And so when those drop rapidly, many times it can indicate pests or disease about two weeks earlier before the human eye can even detect it. Interesting. And so not only that, but we're actually calibrating it for the intensity of light. So you can imagine that on a very bright day, light would reflect very heavily versus a cloudy day. And so one day your crops look healthy, one day they look dead. If you don't have the right sensors or the right data provider like SkyCision, your stress imagery is just going to be wrong because you're not accounting for basically statistical variability. So ours is calibrated to the same scale every single time. So we can also measure the emergence of change and the difference between flight one, flight two, and flight 10. And why does that data capture have to happen from a drone perspective? I mean, if this tech exists, why don't people just go install little pods on the ground or something to track this stuff? Mm -hmm. So it does not have to happen from a drone perspective. We started with drones and I'd say it's really more so the premium solution. We also leverage satellite imagery and uh, much for like much larger acreage scale operations, if you will. Um, but the resolution is a hundred times less, as well as um, you, you can't really see the visual imagery at all in, in most cases. You have cloud cover, atmospheric interference, things like that. From a ground perspective, um, we see a lot of basically sensors being installed in Ag today, whether it's a weather monitor, whether it's a soil moisture probe. But it's a point of source data collection unit, right? And so we know exactly what the measurements are for that location. But if it's a thousand acre operation, we can't necessarily extrapolate that to hundred acres in the other direction. Yep. And so really kind of a layered aerial plus ground solution is where the industry needs to go and kind of where we're facilitating our direction. Got it, Brandon. Let's wrap up here. A quick question. Um, Bootstrapped or have you raised? Uh, we've raised 1.1 million. Okay, state. got it. So you have raised some capital. That's good stuff. Um, and then let's uh, let's wrap up here with the famous five. Number one, what's your favorite business book? Favorite business book? Uh, it's a little cliche, but Zero to One by Peter Thiel. Really enjoyed it. No. Um, kind of just challenged you to think outside of uh, you know traditional perspectives. Number two, is there a CEO you're following or studying right now? Following or studying? Um, I guess you know Elon Musk is always in the news, and so it's hard not to be following him. Um, I, I definitely followed Travis uh, Kalanick through kind of the. Uh, some of the stuff that he went through with Uber on the way out. Uh, I thought that was really kind of interesting from a case study perspective. Um, but I'd say probably those two come to top of mind. Number three, what's your favorite online tool for building your business? Favorite online tool. Um, we use HubSpot pretty religiously. So as our CRM, um, uh, as well as kind of our marketing funnel, so on and so forth. So number four, how many hours of sleep are you getting every night? Uh, uh, it varies, but I'd say on average between four and six. Okay, not normal. Um, when, it's more, when it's more so towards the four side, there's some power naps during the day, but four to six. Yep. And what's your situation? Married, single, kids? Um, girlfriend. We just actually just moved in this past weekend. So we just settled into the, the new place. Um, and uh, yeah. 
That's great. No kiddos yet. Mm-hmm. No kiddos yet. I don't know if I'd be able to <laughs> handle it all. Do both at the same time at this point. <laughs> and how old are you, Brandon? I'm uh, 27. 27. Last question. What do you wish your 20 year old self knew? A 20 year self. 20 year old self. Um, I'd say <laughs> to make it light lighthearted. Uh, I, I'd say the do not disturb button on emails. Um, when you really kind of get in the workforce, it's, it's a huge uh, distraction and productivity hack if you can just really kind of partition your day. Um, mm-hmm put a stop on those. So that's helped me a lot recently. I agree, guys. There you have it from Brendan. Again, founded Skycision, throwing his hat into the ring of the very popular drone industry. It can be dangerous. You can get lost very easily and find yourself competing with big companies. He's hedged that risk by going and hyper-focusing on high-yield crops, where if he solves the problem, it's worth a lot of money. Specifically, he's focused on Napa Valley uh, and even more specifically, obviously, there on vineyards and vineyard production and output, especially on indicators that you know farmers or folks working these vines can't see uh, by themselves visually. So good stuff. They're currently working with about 11 different brands across many hundred uh, different farms, thousands of acres, each farm or each brand paying about a grand per month. So 11 grand in revenue growing fast, hoping to, you know, double or triple that here by the end of the year. Brandon, thank you for taking us to the top. Awesome. Thanks so much, Nathan. Appreciate it.